Yo, 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 what is up, guys? It's your boy Keelan Jazz here. Welcome back to another video. Today, we're going to be reading Eros Theory from the book Logos and Eros. Let's get right into it. Eros Theory Carl Gustav Jung, the 20th century leading deaf psychologist, attempted to integrate the concept of Eros into modern human his civilization's, civilization's awareness. In his mem memoir, Memories, Dreams, and Reflections, he wrote, The fact forces itself on my attention that besides the field of reflection, there is another equally broad, if not broader, area in which rational understanding and reasoning cannot grasp. This is the Eros realm. When such things were properly understood in classical times, Eros was regarded as a motivated divinity force whose divinity transcended our human limits and thus could not be comprehended or represented in any way. I might venture an approach to this deep affection whose range of activity extends from the infinite spaces of the heavens to the dark abysses of hell. As many others have done before me, but I faltered before the task of finding the language that could not adequately express the incalculable paradoxes of love. Eros is a cosmogonist who also serves as the archetypal mother of all higher consciousness. Paul's words, though I speak with the tongues of men and angels and have not love, strike me as the first condition of all co cognition and the essence of divinity itself. Whatever the learned interpretation of the phrase, God is love, the words confirm the Godhead's complexio oppositorium. I've been confronted with the mystery of love many times in my medical career, in my personal life, and I've never been able to explain it. I had to put my hand over my mouth, just like Job. I've already spoken, I'm not going to respond. This is Carl Jung speaking. There are the greatest and smallest, the furthest, farthest and the closest, the highest and lowest, and we can't about, so when we talk about one without talking about the other, we can't talk about one without talking about the other. There is no adequate language to express this paradox. Whatever one may say, no words can fully express the situation. It is always too much or too little to speak of partial aspects because only the whole is meaningful. Love bears everything and endures everything. These words say everything that needs to be said. Nothing more can be said. Because we are both the victims and the instruments of cosmogonic love in the deepest sense. I put the word in quotation marks to show that I don't mean it in the sense of desiring, preferring, favoring, wishing, and other similar emotions, but rather as something greater than the individual, a ununified and undivided whole. Man cannot comprehend this whole because he is only part of it. He is completely reliant on it. He may agree with it or disagree with it and encircled by it. He's reliant on it and nourished by it. Love is both his light and his darkness, with no end in sight. Whether he speaks with the tongues of angels or not, love never ceases or traces of the cell's life to its most fundamental source with scientific precision. Man can try to name love by showering it with all the names he can think of, but he will, never, he will still be caught up in endless self-deceptions. If he has any sense, he will lay down his arms and name the unknown by the more unknown, Ignotum per agne Ignatius, that is, by God's name. That is a confession of the independence and perfection and submission, but also a testament to his freedom to choose between truth and error. Christianity gave Eros poison to drink. She did not die of it, certainly, but degenerated to vice. Friedrich Nietzsche. It has become a modern truism in psychic realm that Eros, the pneuma of chaos, possesses the most peerless question, to love or not to love. Love is an experience that both builds and deconstructs, even though it exi exists outside of time. In the same way that man searches for his soul, he inevitably risks losing his objective, subjective identity for the sake of enlightenment. The Divine Dancer represents a counterintuitive challenge to the conventions of systems analysis and is comparable to autoerotic asphyxiation. Love transcends both good and evil. It represents the flowing interaction between the underlying and natural order of consciousness. Furthermore, love is a difficult concept to investigate because it is inst 
intangible but manifests in one's own sense of aliveness. Those who simply contemplate love produce nothing, whereas those who act on it intimately mingle with it. Because man does not make his ideas, we could say that man's ideas make him. Individuals are in grave danger of mistaking themselves for the mortal being who possesses the soul and should be wary of falling down this deceptive rabbit hole if they look too closely. Despite all indignant, indignant protestations to the contrary, the fact remains that love with its problems and conflicts is of fundamental importance in human life. And as careful investigation consistently demonstrates, it is far more important than the individual expects. It is a universal and archetypal experience that is linked to life rather than just sexuality. Culture develops through the gradual subject, subjugation of man's primordial nature, as we all know. It's a process of domestication that can't be completed without the indistinctual nature's desire for independence rebelling. From time to time, it seems as if a frenzy sweeps through the ranks of men who have been trapped by their culture for far too long. It's difficult to gauge one's own, own time spirit, but among the slew of revolutionary questions that the last half century has spawned, was the sexual question which has spawned a whole new genre of literature. The beginning of psychoanalysis on whose theories it exerted on a very one-sided influence are rooted in this movement. After all, no one can, complete, can be completely free of the currents of this generation. Since then, political and spiritual issues have largely pushed the sexual question to the background that, however, does not change the fact that man's indistinctual, na indistinctual nature is commonly thwarted by the constraints imposed by civilization. The names may change, but the facts do not. We now know that it is not only organic nature that, it, that is at odds with civilized constraints. New ideas often emerge from the unconscious and are just out of, out of sync with the dominant culture as instincts. For example, we could easily construct a political theory of neurosis in the sense that today's man is primarily enthralled by political passions with the sexual question serving as a minor prelude. Politics may just be a harbor, harbinger of a much larger religious upheaval. The neurotic, without realizing it, participate in the dominant currents of his generation and reflects them in his own conflict. This is the heart of the manner which is formless. Neurosis is inextricably linked to the problem of our time, and it essentially represents an individual's failed attempt to solve the general problem in his own person. Self-division is a feature of neurosis. Most people's division is caused by the conscious mind's desire to hold on to its moral idea, while the unconscious pursues its own, in today's terms, immoral idea, which the conscious mind tries to deny. This type of man aspires to be more respectable than he is. However, the conflict cannot easily be, be the other way around. Some men appear to be very disreputable, disreputable and do not exercise the slightest restraint. This is essentially a wicked pose because they have their moral side in the background which has fallen into the unconscious just as surely as the moral side in the case of the moral man. If we look at the history of neurosis with tension, we'll notice that there's always a pivotal point when a problem arises. This evasion is a natural and, and is addressed as a reaction as the laziness, slackness, cowardice, anxiety, ignorance, and unconsciousness that underpin it. We usually hesitate and if we possibly, and if possible, give things a wide berth whenever they are unpleasant difficult or dangerous. Neurosis is the desire of your psyche to be in two places at one time, one of which should be and the other hand which is should not. If you have neurosis, you must find the third path, which is the better way, because we must always overcome some resistance before we can seriously begin disentangling the intricate web throughout the patient work. Dreams, for example, are deeply unconscious, instinctual threads that contain messages Humans have been paying close attention to dreams for a long time, and many dreams in the Bible are significant, significant, such as Nebuchadnezzar's. And in the last days it shall be, declares God, 
that I will pour out my spirit on all flesh, and your sons and daughters shall prophesy, and your young men shall see visions, and your old men shall dream dreams. Even in those days, dream interpreters were in the short supply and high demand. These people are now known as psychoanalysts. Dreams not only show us what we don't know, but we also don't know what we don't know. The unconscious and creativity take precedence over logic in this situation. In dreams, there are some experiences and feelings that are difficult to put into words. When it comes to dream interpretations, it's best to start with the assumption that you don't know what anything. The most important way to get to the pathogenic conflicts is to analyze dreams, as Freud was the first to demonstrate. The stone that the builders rejected, the same is becoming the head of the corner. According to the dream, only, rec only recently has the dream only recently has the dream this fleeting and insignificant appearing product of the psyche been treated with such contempt. It was once regarded as a forerunner of fate, a portent and comforter and a divine messenger. Now I think of it as an emissionary, a missionary of the unconscious, whose job is to reveal the secrets of the unconscious to the conscious mind, which it does, it does with astonishing accuracy. It was Jesus who himself who, re who was rejected and set aside, and thus gave us the grace of death and resurrection. We too can realize that in the struggles and mysteries of our life, God is doing. We induce the dreamer to talk about the detail of his dream while following certain technical rules. It quickly becomes apparent that his associations tend in a particular direction and cluster around specific topics. Only God can accurately give people insights into dreams. They said to him, We have had dreams, and there is no one to interpret them. And Joseph said to them, Do not interpretations belong to God? Please th tell them to me. These are personal in nature and yield a meaning that could never have been conjectured to lie behind the dream. But which, as careful comparison has revealed, stands in an extremely delicate and meticulously exact relationship to the dream facade. The conflict we're looking for, or rather a variation of it, is conditioned by circumstances, is this particular complex of ideas in which all the threads of the dream are woven together. Agreed, she replied, let it be as you say. So she sent them away and they departed, and she tried the scarlet cord in the window. The painful and incompatible elements of the conflict are thus covered up or obliterated, according to Freud, to the point where we can speak of a wish fulfillment. However, dreams rarely fulfill all obvious desires such as in so-called body stimulus dreams, such as the sensation of hunger while sleeping when the desire for food is satisfied by dreaming about delicious meals. Similarly, the pressing need to get up, which conflicts with the desire to sleep longer, leads to the wish-fulfilling dream idea that one has already gone up and so on. For if, after they have escaped the defilements of the world, through the, save, through the knowledge of our Lord and the Savior Jesus Christ, they are again entangled in them and overcome the last state, has become worse for them than the first. For it would have been better for them never to have known the way of righteousness, than after knowing it to turn back from the holy commandment delivered to them. What the true proverb says has happened to them the dog returns to its vomit and so after washing herself returns to wallow in the mire there are also unconscious wishes according to freud that is incompatible with the ideas of the waking mind painful wishes wishes that one would rather not admit that these are the wishes that freud consists to be considered true architects of the dream for example a daughter loves her mother julie but dreams that she is dead be much to her dismay according to freud this daughter has an un unbeknownst wish to see her mother removed from the world as soon as possible because she has a secret resistance to her. Even the most blameless daughter such moods may occur, but they would be met with the most violent denial if one tried to saddle her with them. This is called the death instinct, also known as thanatos, the unconscious drive towards decay, destruction, and aggression, described as the wish to be to die turned against objects other than the self. To all appearances, the manifest dreams contain no traces of wish fulfillment, rather of apprehension or alarm. Consequently, the direct opposite of the supposed unconscious impulse, 
but we know, now know well enough that exaggerated alarm can often and rightly be suspected of the contrary. Here the critical reader may just justifiably ask, when is the alarm in a dream exaggerated? Such dreams in which there is apparently no trace of wish fulfillment are innumerable. The conflict worked out in the dream is unconscious and so is the attempted solution. Actually, there does exist in our dream dreamer the tendency to be rid of her mother, expressed in the language of the unconscious. She wants her mother to die. But the dreamer should certainly not be saddled with this tendency because strictly speaking it was not she who was fabricated who fabricated the dream, but the unconscious. The unconscious has this tendency most unexpected from the dreamer's point of view to get rid of the mother. The very fact that she can dream such a thing proves that she does not consciously think of it. She has no notion why her mother should get be got rid of. This is called the Electra Complex. Now we know that a certain layer of the unconscious contains everything that has passed beyond the recall of memory, including all those infantile instinctual impulses which could find no outlet in adult life. We can say that the bulk of what came, comes out of the unconscious has an infantile character at first. The dream is frequently filled with seemingly absurd details, giving the impression of its absurdity, or it is so unintelligible on the surface that it leaves us completely perplexed. As a result, we must always overcome some resistance before we can begin to disentangle the intricate web throughout patient work. But when we finally get to the bottom of it, we find ourselves deeper in the secrets of the dreamer. We are astounded to learn that an apparently meaningless dream is actually quite significant and that it speaks only of important and serious matters. This discovery necessitates greater respect for the so-called superstition that dreams have meaning which our, our age and rate rationalistic temper, rationalistic temper has previously dismissed. Dream analysis, as Sigmund Freud put it, is the via regia to the unconscious. It provides direct access to the deepest personal secrets, making it an invaluable tool in the hands of the soul's physician and educator. The analytical method in general and not just Freudian psychoanalysis, psychoanalysis in particular consists primarily of numerous dreams analysis. Dreams successfully throw up the contents of the unconscious during treatment to expose them to the disinfecting power of daylight. Much that is valuable and thought lost is thus found again. It's only natural that many people with erroneous self-perception would find this treatment to be torturous. They are called upon to give up in a, give up in their cherished illusions for something deeper, fair, and more embracing to arise within them. Following the old saying, give up what thou hast, then shalt thou receive. It's genuine old wisdom that comes to light again in the dream, and strangely, this kind of psychic education should be required in our culture's heyday. It can be compared to the Socratic method in several ways, though it must be noted that psychoanalysis reaches far greater depths and heights. The Freudian model of investigation aimed to demonstrate that this erotic or sexual factor plays a significant role in the pathogenic conflict's origin. According to this theory, the conscious mind tends coll collides, the mind's trend collides with the unconscious mind's immoral and compatible wish. The unconscious, which is infantile in the sense that it is on a wish from a childish past that will no longer be appropriate in the present, and thus represent our moral grounds. This neurotic has the soul of a child who is afflicted by arbitrary restrictions, whose meaning he does not comprehend. He tries to internalize his morality, but finds himself in a conflict with one himself. One side wants to suppress while the other yearns to be free, and this conflict is known as neurosis. No temptation has overtaken you that is not common to man. God is faithful, and he will not let you be tempted beyond your ability, but with te the temptation, he will also provide the way of escape that you may be able to endure it. 1 Corinthians 10, 13 Neurotic symptoms appear only when we are unable to see the other side of our nat nature and the urgency of its problems. If the conflict were fully conscious in all of its parts, it would presumably never give rise to neurotic symptoms. 
The symptom appears only in these circumstances, and it aids in the expression of the unacknowledged side of the psyche. According to Freud, the symptom is the fulfillment of unrecognized desires that when made conscious clash violently with our moral convictions. As previously stated, the patient cannot deal with this shadow of the psyche because it is hidden from the conscious scrutiny. He can't correct it, accept it, or dismiss it because in reality he doesn't possess the unconscious impulses at all. There have been autonomous complexes thrust out of the hierarchy of the conscious psyche and it is the task of analysis to not without great resistance to bring them back under control. Some patients boast that the shadow side does not exist for them. They assure us that they have no conflict, but they fail to notice that other things of unknown origin obstruct their path. Hysterical moods, underhanded th tricks they play on themselves and, the, and their neighbors, a nervous karar of the stomach, pains in various places, irritability for no apparent reason, and a whole host of nervous symptoms. The Ten Commandments, which were the law, provided the first psychological, the psychological direction. All of these rules had to be followed by early humans who were Moses' followers. The issue is that we follow the rules even when they are broken, and no one pours new wine into old wineskins. Otherwise, the wine will burst the skins and both the wine and the wineskin will be ruined. No, they pour new wineskin into old new wineskins. There's nothing in the unconscious that says that you have to respect and honor your parents. For a variety of reasons, many people do not honor their father or mother. When something isn't moral or amoral, we need to speak in a language that isn't concerned with morality in many ways. Nature has no emotions. All it knows is the weather. Nature will both kill you and nourish you. When you approach the unconscious in the same way that nature does, it is not punitive, discerning, judgmental, or even decisive. It simply is present, so there is purity of an intensity of archetypal voice that can be heard. Without trapping a Without trapping of the expectation of what is good or bad, it's more of the what already exists. But ask the beasts and they will teach you, the birds of the heavens and they will tell you, or the bushes of the earth and they will teach you, and the fish of the sea they will declare to you, who among all those does not know that the hand of the Lord has, not, has done this? In his hand, in his life of every living thing and the breath of all mankind. Job 12, 7 verse 10. Moses was dealing with many issues within his group that were causing him problems. One of those was the covenanting thy neighbor's wife, and another was murdering and so on. He was trying to lay down big, broad brush rules so people could live in society despite man's primordial instincts. This was the old covenant law. I never saw a wild thing sorry for itself. A small bird will drop frozen dead from a, from a bot from a bow without ever knowing, without ever having felt sorry for itself. D. H. Lawrence Freudian psychoanalysis has been accused of unleashing man's thankfully suppressed instincts and causing untold harm. This fear just demonstrates how little faith we have in the effectiveness of our moral principles. People pretend that only the morality preached from the pulpit keeps men from acting without restraint However, necessity is a far more effective regulator, setting bounds that are far more real and persuasive than any moral precepts. True psychoanalysis awakens instincts, but not contrary to popular belief, to grant them unrestricted freedom, but rather to integrate them into a purposeful, purposeful way. It is always advantageous to be in complete control of one's personality, otherwise the repressed elements will surface as a hindrance elsewhere not just at some insignificant point, but right where we are most vulnerable. It is hoped that if people can be educated to see the shadow side of their nature clearly, they will be able, better able to understand and love their fellow man. A little less hypocrisy and a little more self-awareness can only help us respect our neighbors because we are all too prone to transferring the injustice and violence we inflict on our own natures to our fellows. The Freudian theory of repression, repression appears to suggest that are, there are only hypermoral people who suppress their immoral instinctive nature. As a result, the immoral man should be immune to neurosis if he lives a life of unrestrict, 
unrestrained instinct. As experience has shown, this is clearly not the case. A man like this can be just as neurotic as anyone else. When we examine him, we discover that his morality has been suppressed. In Nietzsche's famous phrase, the neurotic immoralist represents the pale felon who does not live up to his actions. Of course, we can argue that the repressed remnants of dec decency are simply a traditional hangover from a childhood that imposes an unnecessary check on instinctual nature and a result should be eliminated. The Akrasis Elephant principle would lead to an absolute libertinism, libertinism theory that would of course be fantastic and nonsensical. It must never be forgotten and the Freudian school must be reminded that morality is a function of the human soul as old as humanity itself and it was not imposed on people on ta tables of stone from Sinai. Morality is not imposed from without, from without. We have it from the beginning, not the law, but our moral nature without which human society's collective life would be impossible. As a result, morality exists at all levels of society. It is the herd's instinctive action regulator that also governs the herd's collective life. Moral laws, on the other hand, are only valid within a small human group. They stop after that. Homo homini lupus, as the old saying goes, we have succeeded in subjecting every ever larger human groups to the same morality as civilization has progressed, but we have not yet we have yet to bring the moral code to prevail beyond social frontiers. That is, in the free space between mutually independent societies, there reigns lawlessness, license, and ha mad immorality, as it has, has for centuries. The only the enemy dares to say it aloud. A true artist sees a duality and seeks out the, tr uh, the reconciling third, which they can express through the art. That is exactly what is required for neurosis. No neurosis exists in isolation, however you may have several interconnected complexes. The role of a therapist is to gradually open them up and get to the bottom of things. We are instinctual beings at our core and we must be able to understand that those instincts are telling us before we can compare it to how we live in society. The Freudian school is so convinced of the central, if not exclusive role of sexuality in a neurosis that is, has drawn the logical conclusion and violently attacked contemporary sexual morality. This was undeniably beneficial and necess necessary because in this field ideas that are too undifferentiated in life of the extremely complicated state of affairs predominated and continued to predominate. Similarly to how finance was scorned in the early Middle Ages because there was no differentiated financial morality to suit each case, only a mass morality, there is only a mass sexual morality today. Nobody questions whether or not a girl who has an illegitimate child is a decent human being. Any form of love that is not sanctioned by law is considered immoral whether it is between good or good people or between strangers, we are still so hypnotized by what occurs that we forget how and to become, whom it occurs. Just as finance was nothing but gleaming in gold in the Middle Ages, fiercely coveted and thus the devil do not quench the spirit. First Death of Thessalonians 5 verse 19 However, things aren't quite that simple. Eros is a dubious character who will always be so regardless be so, regardless of what future legislation says about him. On the part one hand, he is a part of man's primordial nature, which will continue to exist as long as he has a body. On the other hand, he is linked to the highest spiritual forms. However, he thrives only when his spirit and instincts are in sync. If he lacks one or both of these qualities, the result is an injury or at the very least a lopsidedness that can easily become pathological. Too much animal distorts the civilized man, and too much civilization causes animals to become sick. This conundrum reveals Eros's deep apprehensions about the man, because at its core, Eros is a force that, like nature, always, uh, always allows itself to be conquered and exploited as if it were powerless. However, before victory over nature comes at a high price. Behold, the days are coming, declares the Lord. When I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and the house of Judah, 
not like the covenant that I made with their fathers on the day when I took them by the hand to bring them out of the land of Egypt. My covenant that they broke, though I was their husband, declares the Lord. But this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, declares the Lord. I will put my law within him, within them, and I will write it on their hearts. And I will be their God, and they shall be my people. And no longer shall each one of them teach one teaches his neighbor and each brother saying know the lord for they shall all know me for the least of them to the greatest declares the lord for i will give forgive their iniquity and i will remember their sin no more jeremiah 31 31 verse 34 nature doesn't ask for philosophical explanations all it asks for is patience and judicious use of resources the drive for ensuring the survival of the individual and the species of by satisfying the needs for food, water, air, and sex is a life instinct, and libido is an inner psychic energy that cannot be channeled into other, into other areas such as development and sustaining of relationships, creative and artistic endeavors, and contemplative and spiritual activities. Those who live according to the flesh have their minds set on what the flesh desires but those who live following who live following the spirit have their minds set on what the spirit desires romans 8 verse 5 these are articulations of the impulse which plays a key role in the human psyche within the psyche they all serve a, serve a purpose and they all coalesce ultimately to guide the psyche on the journey to individuation the connecting nature of eros's characterizes human's consciousness more than the more than the discrimination and cognition associated with logos, where logos is ordering and instant insistence, eros is dis, is dissolution and movement. Eros is typically less developed in men in men than many than logos because men, most men are erotically blinded. They commit the unpardon, part, unpardonable mistake of confusing eros with sex. Humans eros on the other hand is a manifestation of their actual character whilst their logos are frequently a happy accident. Where love reigns there is no will to power and where the will to power to, is paramount love is lacking. The one is but the shadow of the other. The man who adopts the standpoint of eros finds his commissary opposite in the will to power and out of the man who puts the accent on power is eros. Conclusively, the Bible says, 1 Corinthians 13, verse 4, verse 4 to 13, that love is patient and that love is kind. It does not envy, it does not boast, it is not proud, it does not dishonor others, it is not self-seeking, it is not easily angered, it keeps no record of wrongs, love does not, does not delight in evil but rejoices with the truth, it always protects, always trusts, always hopes, always pers perseveres. Love never fails, but whereas there are prophecies, they will cease. Where there are tongues, they will be stilled. Where there is knowledge, it will pass away. Alright guys, thank you guys for watching. Stay tuned for the next video. Easy.